Good afternoon. Please be advised that today's webinar will be streamed live on YouTube via simultaneous translation between Korean and English. Our participants can use the links that we have provided on the YouTube chat feed to choose between English and Korean to tune into today's webinar. And we'll now begin today's webinar, which is co-hosted by AIGCC and Chipyong LLC on the theme Shareholder Climate Change Engagement and Effective Communication Strategies. I would like to first express my appreciation to everyone joining us today, and I hope it will be a rewarding occasion for everyone. Uh, we will invite Chief Executive Officer of the AIGCC, Ms. Rebecca McWalla Wright, who sent in a kind video. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca McWalla Wright. I'm the CEO of the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change. AIGCC is an initiative to create awareness and encourage action among Asia's asset owners and financial institutions about the risks and opportunities associated with climate change and low carbon investing. We now have close to 70 members from 11 markets across the region, representing over USD 39 trillion in assets under management. I'd like to thank Jipyong for co-hosting this seminar with us to discuss the trend of shareholder climate change actions. Investor engagement with companies on climate change has grown, in particular through collaborative exercises such as the Climate Action 100 Plus initiative and AIGCC's Asia Utilities Engagement Program. Through a shared agenda, peer investors collaborate on corporate engagement activities to drive more ambitious climate goals with corporates. These investors take on a stewardship role as they engage with companies on a clear strategy for escalation and an alignment between their engagement and their voting. Each company has an important role to play in driving the global transition to net zero emissions. In Korea, investors have been engaging with KEPCO, POSCO Holdings and SK Innovation through Climate Action 100 Plus. Now that all three companies have committed to net zero by 2050, investors need to further engage with these companies to ensure sound implementation of their plans for the transition to net zero. Corporate engagement in Asia can take a few forms. The most common forms of engagement we have seen include private dialogues between investors and companies, such as conversations to understand companies' target setting and net zero transition plans. Progress in these engagements is through the investors' use of their ownership rights to accelerate company commitments towards ambitious climate goals, and that can be considered as part of the corporate engagement strategy. By framing a purposeful dialogue with companies, investors can support companies in the development of their net zero transition roadmap with a long-term view and focus the exchanges on the practical business case for transition and to better understand barriers to climate action. Regulators in Asian markets are signaling support for active ownership. In Korea, the stewardship code refers to shareholder proposals in setting out the broad scope of activities in implementing institutional investors' stewardship responsibilities as early as 2016. The momentum built by the regulators will undoubtedly bring about more Asian market level regulatory guidance to follow suit. While we see the increased ambition in corporate climate commitment in recent years, which is very welcome and necessary, an incredible amount more needs to be done to support a smooth and orderly transition. Corporate engagement in each market may be nuanced in its own way, but ultimately the need to strengthen the impact of investor stewardship and support the transition in the real economy remains unchanged. Korean companies are well positioned to identify their role in the region and their competitive positioning in the transition to a low carbon economy. Both global and domestic investors are also well positioned and increasingly keen to engage with companies on their net zero transition plans. We all know we need to make decisive action on climate and companies that are moving quickly will have a competitive advantage in this transition. There is no time to waste. With that, I'd like to thank you for joining this webinar today and I really hope you enjoy the findings that you'll hear throughout and look forward to engaging with you sometime soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was Chief Executive Officer of AIGCC, Rebecca Nicola Wright. Thank you very much. And now we will invite Mr. Im Song Tech, Managing Partner at Chipping LLC, who is also the head of the ESG Center, 
at the law firm to also deliver opening remarks. Yes, good afternoon. Very nice to meet you. This is uh, In Song Tech, managing partner, attorney at law at Jipyong LLC. Shareholder engagement. Well, engagement. I think uh, this word is often used in many contexts between stakeholders, for example. So we translate into Kwanyo, but it's ultimately about engaging in relationships. And so I think maybe a fuller uh, translation to Korean rather than just the short word itself better illustrates the essence of this concept. It is about engaging in relations with shareholders. And so this has been expanding uh, as a major uh, trend among intensifying ESG trends as well, broader adoption of stewardship both by investors. And uh, we have been observing active shareholder engagement, particularly around the theme of climate change. Principle number two under the UN principles for responsible investment states, we will be active owners and incorporate ESG issues into our ownership policies and practices. And so the signatories are committing to become active owners. So uh, active owners and also active investors in terms of our behavior and shareholder related policies. The companies are also committing to incorporate ESG. So many pension funds and global investors uh, in and outside of Korea are now uh, engaging more proactively around shareholder engagement practices. So for corporates, this may be like having another mother-in-law around. Uh, it might be seen as a hassle or an added burden for the corporates. However, if anything, um, the companies actually should look at shareholder engagement as an opportunity for better communication with its shareholders and an opportunity to innovate its CSG practices. And so this can help earn greater trust and support from their stakeholders as well. So today we are happy to co-host today's webinar together with the AIGCC, the Asian Investor Group on Climate Change. So what happened was AIGCC and Client Earth actually published together a book called Net Zero Engagement in Asia, a guide to shareholder climate resolution. And we were happy to take part in the publication um, together with other law firms in Asia, where we introduce the latest legal development issues surrounding shareholder engagement in the different geographies. So as a major trend, there is uh, growing legislation uh, and also many uh, different changes uh, on the corporate scene. And so obviously more companies are paying attention to this theme. And so hopefully um, today will be rewarding and insightful to everyone taking part, as well as organizations and corporations that you may represent. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for uh, the opening remarks. And now we will begin with the webinar in earnest. Session one is on the theme of legal trends and shareholder engagement related to climate change focusing on Asia. The first presenter will be Ms. Elizabeth Wu, attorney and legal consultant uh, of Energy Systems Asia at Client Earth. So um, she will take us through the topic, global legal trends on climate related shareholder engagement. Hi, um, a very good um, one afternoon to everyone. My name is Elizabeth Wu. I am a legal consultant with Client Earth, an international environmental law NGO, and a visiting researcher with the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law. In Asia, Client Earth works with the private and public sector on topical legal analysis and capacity building in support of the net zero transition. I'd like to express my deep gratitude to Jip Yong LLC for the opportunity to participate in this interesting and topical webinar. Today, I am very pleased to be giving a presentation on global legal trends on climate-related shareholder engagement. I'd like to begin by highlighting the global response by investors to climate-related financial risk. 
climate risk can take the form of physical risk and transition risk. Physical risk can arise from event-driven hazards or longer-term shifts in climate patterns. Transition risks arise from the potential for loss resulting from a shift toward a lower carbon economy. This can be driven by regulations, low carbon technology advancements, consumer sentiment, and liability risks. Because climate change can have a financial impact on companies, institutional investors are increasingly recognizing that they must account for this in their investment processes. Institutional investors have fiduciary duties which are legal obligations to act prudently in the best interests of their clients. And the exact content of the fiduciary duties differs according to the type of investors and the jurisdiction they are in. But generally, investors must act with reasonable care, skill, and diligence and in the best interests of clients. These duties are increasingly understood as taking into account climate-related risk and opportunities in investment decisions and increased engagement with companies. In 2019, the United Nations Environment Programme Finance Initiative and the Principles of Responsible Invest Investment, which is the world's leading proponent of responsible investment, published a report on fiduciary duty in the 21st century after a four-year study. Now, this report observed that the integration of ESG issues into investment practices and processes and into company engagement is increasingly seen as established practice Investors that fail to incorporate ESG issues are failing their fiduciary duties and are increasingly likely to be subject to legal challenge. So the upshot of all these developments is that global institutional investor groups are mobilizing around climate change with increased engagement with companies. One of the most significant investor and engagement initiatives on climate between investors and companies is Climate Action 100 Plus. It was launched in 2017 by five regional investor networks and five investor representatives. Uh, Rebecca has uh, given some overview on that. Um, and the AIGCC, of course, is the Asia focused network. Climate Action 100 Plus consists of 700 investors um, and 160 focused companies. So there are three broad Climate Action 100 Plus asks that investors make of companies. Um, the first is strengthen uh, governance framework for climate risk. The second is greenhouse gas emissions reductions in line with Paris Agreement goals. And the third is TCFD and sector-specific corporate disclosure. Now, asks are high-level agenda, and investors are encouraged to identify more detailed company-specific expectations and actively communicate with companies on these. Say 100 Plus also tracks focus companies' performance on net zero transition. Its disclosure framework indicators evaluate the adequacy of corporate disclosure, and its alignment assessments evaluate the alignment of company actions with the Paris Agreement goals. CA 100 Plus engagement is spearheaded by a lead investor or investors who work cooperatively with a number of collaborating investors. And in the panel discussion in the later part of this webinar, we are privileged to have with us Ms. Valerie Kwan, Director of Engagement of AIGCC. She will explain more about the work of C100 Plus and AIGCC in Asia. So what exactly constitutes a uh, climate-related resolution? Well, this is understood broadly as any resolution that relates to the climate uh, directly or indirectly. Even... Um, Resolutions which do not explicitly mention the word climate may have an impact on the climate. You can see on this slide some non-exhaustive examples. Um, they could include uh, the development by the company of a Paris Alliance strategy or various disclosures by the company. So overall, there is an increasing trend of climate-related shareholder resolutions globally. 2021 was a high point of investor support for climate change resolutions. In 2022, investors were more selective with a higher level of scrutiny, focusing more on strategic issues such as companies' energy transition planning, targets, and capital expenditure. In the U.S., according to Ceres, the U.S. Uh, C100 Plus Investor Group, there were 236 climate-related resolutions filed in 2022 and there were 110 agreements reached on climate-related shareholder resolutions. This is a record number and includes agreements by electric utilities to set targets for reducing scope-tree greenhouse gas emissions, 
going beyond their usual scope one and two targets. In Europe, according to Moro Sadali, a shareholder advisory firm, while there has been less support for shareholder proposed climate resolutions than in 2021, there has been an increase in management proposed say on climate resolutions in 2022. These are management proposed climate plans put to an advisory shareholder vote. Since early 2021, they have gained significant support at AGMs, and this has increased in 2022, with the most resolutions submitted in the United Kingdom and in France. So in the interest of time, it's not possible to cover the many shareholder resolutions from the 2021 and 2022 AGM seasons. And this slide just uh, provides a brief taste of some notable resolutions. The HSBC 2021 AGM is an interesting example because this resolution was proposed by the board in response to an investor-led shareholder resolution. Um, and that shareholder resolution was proposed by a 2.4 trillion coalition of investors who filed a shareholder resolution calling on HSBC to reduce its exposure to fossil fuels. Now, negotiations ensued and eventually the investor coalition agreed to withdraw the shareholder proposal in exchange for the board-backed resolution, which, as you can see on the slide, passed uh, with uh, substantial support. Another interesting example is ExxonMobil 2022 AGM. Now, one successful resolution there requested an audited report which outlined how the International Energy Agency's modelling um, for a net zero economy would affect um, various assumptions in financial statements. The board recommended voting against the resolution, but despite that, the resolution passed with 52% support. So, um, as Rebecca has already mentioned in her introduction, there has been increasing regulatory support for corporate climate engagement. As you can see on the slide, um, this is present in the Korea Stewardship Code, in Japan's Corporate Governance Codes, as well as the Singapore Stewardship Principles. So, the Singapore Stewardship Principles is an example, were developed by an industry-led committee and supported by the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Singapore Exchange. As you can see from the extract uh, quoted in the slides, um, the principles recommend that investors stay active through constructive and purposeful engagement. So in light of these developments, Client Earth and AIGCC has co-published co the Net Zero Engagement in Asia, a guide to shareholder uh, climate resolutions in November last year. And we are very grateful for Jip Yong and support in all of this. Um, this guide is a resource for Asia-focused investors considering shareholder resolutions as a complement to broader engagement options when exercising responsible stewardship on climate matters. This guide showcases the views of local experts experts uh, from 11 Asian jurisdictions and we are privileged to have had Mr. Chang Wook Min and his team from Jipyong LLC as the legal expert for Korea. Um, this guide is meant to complement uh, stewardship options calibrated as appropriate to each engagement and within a very specific local context. Um, this guide is a high-level reference and it's not legal advice for any specific case. Um, I'm also happy to say that the guide has been referred to with approval in the PRI's recently published report on filing impactful shareholder resolutions. So this slide provides a list of legal experts from 11 jurisdictions who have contributed, and these experts come from top law firms across Asia and include leaders and senior members of the legal fraternity. Um, they provide various insights on shareholder climate resolutions and also a summary of key developments relevant to climate risk and ESG so that investor engagement is situated within its appropriate local context. So on this particular slide shows some questions um, on climate resolutions that are addressed by the legal experts in the guide. So for instance, uh, whether it is required or recommended that a shareholder climate resolution be framed um, as an amendment to the company's charter documents, the types of shareholder resolutions available, for instance, because some jurisdictions do not have the concept of advisory resolutions. And of course, what are the thresholds for passing a resolution or filing a resolution? Um, and another kind of process and formal requirements. So in all, shareholder climate resolutions can be proposed in all 11 Asian jurisdictions in the guide, although the manner and requirements of doing so differ. In terms of whether shareholder climate resolutions fall within the normal matters that shareholders can bring resolutions on, this differs across jurisdictions. 
In the People's Republic of China, the experts um, have uh, observed that generally shareholders have rights to propose and vote on shareholder climate resolutions and receive protections of such rights under PRC law. The range of matters that shareholders can file resolutions and vote on is wide and include decisions on the business policies and investment plans of the company. So a shareholder climate resolution can normally be proposed as an ordinary resolution. In Hong Kong, the legal experts observed that generally shareholders can bring resolutions on a wide range of matters, including shareholder climate resolutions. Now, this is unless they are specifically prohibited by the company's articles of association. If the company has not adopted specific articles of association, then Hong Kong law stipulates that model articles of association apply as a default and this contains no restrictions on the bringing of shareholder climate resolutions. So that the diversity of approaches across Asia makes it imperative that investors considering filing a resolution obtain bespoke legal and other advice. So I just want to briefly highlight Japan as a case study as an Asian jurisdiction with increasing developments and climate-related resolutions. In terms of the legal framework in Japan, the legal expert observes that generally, a shareholder climate resolution would not normally fall within the matters that shareholders can consider. It would normally have to be in the form of an amendment to the Articles of Incorporation that incorporates the climate objective and that shareholder climate resolutions are brought in Japan predominantly in this form. Um, there are minimum holding periods for shareholders as well as restrictions on the bringing of resolutions that are substantially the same as one that was uh, previously brought. And in the 2022 AGM season, there were a total of 293 shareholder proposals made to 77 Japanese private publicly listed companies. Of this number, seven companies listed on the slide received shareholder proposals related to environmental measures. Now, although no resolution passed, um, there is an increasing trend for such resolutions in Japan. This slide shows examples of the progression of shareholder climate resolutions in Japan since 2020 to date. So in 2020, Kiko Network, a Japanese NGO, proposed a resolution requiring Mizuho Financial Group to disclose in its annual reporting a plan outlining a management strategy to align investments with the Paris Agreement goals. This is understood to be the first major shareholder climate resolution in Japan. Now, although the resolution did not succeed, um, it did receive substantial support of 34% uh, uh, affirmative votes. Um, and this paved the way for more shareholder climate resolutions in following years. So you can see on the slide some examples from 2021. And in 2022, for the first time, there were substantial institutional investor-backed shareholder climate resolutions that were brought. Uh, these were filed at J-Power, an electric utility in Japan, and the filing group was a $3 trillion in, uh, institutional investor group comprising Amandi, Man Group, and HSBC Asset Management. They co-filed the resolutions with ACCR, a research and shareholder advocacy organization. The second and third resolutions here are particularly interesting. Um, they entail reporting of alignment of capital expenditure plans with emissions reduction targets, as well as reporting on how remuneration policies will incentivize progress on emissions reductions targets. The re resolutions received between 18 to 26 percent support, as you can see on the slide. Um, and even if the resolutions did not pass, uh, this does show that there is uh, not insubstantial proportion of shareholders that voted in favor. And this is a signaling force to show shareholders' concern with climate risk. So finally, I'd like to end off this presentation with some observations on the slide by Mr. Mark Carney, the co-chair of GFANS and United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance. He highlights the importance for companies to develop business models that align with a net zero transition and address climate risk. This underscores the growing momentum of shareholder engagement on climate change. Uh, we will keenly follow further developments globally and in Asia. Thank you very much for your kind attention. It has been a pleasure giving this presentation. Thank you very much for that very detailed and rich presentation. So let's move to the second presentation. Uh, the second presentation will be delivered by Min Chang Wook, a partner from LLC, to talk about legal trends of shareholder engagement in Korea. Hello, it's a pleasure to meet you. I am Min Chang Wook, partner working in Chicken LLC.
Um, so the title of my presentation is Legal Trends of Shareholder Engagement in Korea. Uh, with Elizabeth O'Connor, uh, who just presented before, uh, we worked together uh, to publish uh, the Net Zero Engagement Asia Guide to the Climate Resolutions. As climate change in ESG has become key topics of discussion, shareholders and in local institutional investors are becoming more active with the company. And as for shareholder engagement strategies related to climate change, are related to letter conversations, monitoring, and campaigns, among other non legal shareholder activities. And the other part is shareholder resolutions, exercising of voting rights, or shareholder derivative lawsuits, and other legal exercise of shareholder rights. As you can see on the picture on the left side, uh, this is the Dutch APG sending shareholder letters to Samsung and other large corporations in Korea to pressure them to take action on climate change. Or the largest investor uh, group is waging a campaign to phase out coal fired power plants in Korea as non legal shareholder activities. So, this is classified as non legal shareholder activity on the left side of the slide. And on the right side, but there is an increasing number of shareholder resolutions on environment. Also, for example, um, shareholders are voting down on a resolution or filing a lawsuit against the company related to environmental issues. We see many news articles that are being published to that end. And today, we'll take a closer look at the letter, which is the right to shareholder resolution in Korea. First, let's take a look at what can constitute the issue for the resolution. In Korea, uh, Article 361 of the Commercial Act is interpreted to mean that shareholders can make shareholder resolutions as provided for by the Act and the AOI Articles of Incorporation only regarding the authority or powers of general meeting of shareholders. Among these, the Act, that is the authority of general meeting of shareholders, as stipulated by the law, can be broadly into matters where special resolutions can be made, second, a matter where ordinary resolutions can be made. A special resolution requires at least two, two thirds of the voting rights of the shareholders present at the meeting, or at least one third of the total number of issued and outstanding shares. An amendment in the company's AOI, MA, removal of a director, or changes to the structure of the subject to SR. And an ordinary resolution requires at least one half of the voting rights of the shareholders present at the meeting, or at least one fourth of the total number of issued and outstanding share. Appointment of directors, auditors, or remuneration of auditors. A director or some ordinary resolution. And accordingly, once a shareholder resolution is submitted, the PUD will be received and will be taking that up as an agenda for shareholder resolution. Only it is provided for by law. Uh, but of course, as you can see over here, um, there could be differences or perhaps uh, related to the level of an incumbent officer in list of companies and matters concerning deeper dissemination of a particular person, uh, such matters may be rejected. Next, let's take a look at uh, the requirement legal effects of shareholder resolutions. First of all, you have to have the formative requirements. Shareholder resolutions uh, should be submitted in writing or electronic form prior to the date of the GSM. And in addition, shareholder resolutions can only be filed by minority shareholders who hold more than a certain percentage of shares. For example, a private company uh, can file uh, by holding more than 3% of the shares. And for a public company, and depending on the size, it may be filed by a minority share, whether it's by 5% or 1% of the shares in one six months, or regardless of the holding period, a minority shareholder should holding more than 3% of the shares. And this minimum shareholding requirement may be jointly met by multiple shareholders. Once we have the formal requirements, uh, once you submit a proposal uh, that is allowed under the law, then the BOD shall include uh, the legitimate shareholders' resolution in the agenda of the system and obliged to notify shareholders accordingly. If the BOD rejects a legitimate shareholder resolution, then the minority shareholder can file a preliminary exemption with the court to include it. And the BOD, by the Commercial Act, if requested by minority shareholders, must give an opportunity to explain the resolution at the shareholders' meeting. And if a shareholder resolution passes a resolution, 
then it shall have a binding force immediately upon resolution. That means that the company is legally obliged then to fulfill the resolution. And also the Korean uh, Commercial Act does not have any provisions regarding advisory shareholder resolutions or non binding and shareholder resolution rights under the Korean Commercial Act have certain limitations. Unless it is a specific provided for uh, in the AOI, uh, shareholder uh, proposal, uh, there's also, for example, in relation to the appointment of the directors, and certain matters can only be proposed. So if an agenda for climate change related to uh, shareholder resolution, if it leads, it has to be, it can only be limited to, for example, you know, director with environmental expertise or making appointments to be related to that. However, in the United States, shareholder resolution requirements have been relaxed, resulting in shareholder resolutions on a variety of climate-related issues. For example, as of 2022, a shareholder resolution was submitted for Costco to adopt carbon neutrality targets, and for Phillips 66, a resolution to disclose a carbon neutrality implementation plan was made and for J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and Citigroup, they have been filed resolutions to stop a policy to stop investing in fossil fuels. Sorry. Um, so between 2012 to 2021, in terms of shareholder resolution trends in Korea, there were a total of 554 shareholder resolutions filed for 99 listed companies on the cost exchange and 851 for 133 companies listed on the cost exchange. Um, notably, the Korean Stewardship Code was first adopted in 2016, and since then, we have seen a gradual increase in shareholder resolution items uh, tabled at general shareholders' meetings from 2017 and onwards. On the left, you can see that there were only 75 uh, in items in 2016, but this rose to 154 in 2017 and 214 in 2018. That being said, the approval rate for these shareholder resolutions is still somewhat uh, low around 10% or so with no change. Now let's analyze shareholder resolution trends in a bit more detail. First, a significant share of uh, the shareholder resolutions, as you can see from the breakdown, had to do with the appointment or removal of officers and directors. So as you can see, about half are related to the appointment of executive directors, outside directors, and auditors. Uh, there were a number of solutions seeking re removal of directors as well. It seems that less than 10% were seeking amendment of a company's Articles of Incorporation, AOI. And of these resolution items, if you look at the subject matter, uh, actually, more than half, most had to do with the operations of the board of directors. Uh, matters such as increasing the number of seats on the board, however, changing the board structure, um, or revising the eligibility criteria for directors, um, would be included under these types of resolutions. Um, they all first require an amendment to the AOI. Um, and then let's look at a real life case of shareholder resolutions raised with regard to ESG. Although not related to climate change, uh, there was an important uh, shareholder resolution raised last year at a general shareholders meeting with regard to the social dimension of ESG. Uh, with regard to health and safety matters. So last year in January, uh, there was a very unfortunate serious accident where an apartment building that was under construction by HDC Hyundai Industrial Development collapsed, taking the lives of six workers on site. So Korean NGO called Solidarity for Economic Reform was commissioned by APG, the Dutch Public Pension Fund, to submit a shareholder proposal seeking an amendment to the AOI at HDC's regular shareholders meeting seeking four resolutions that are listed here. First, they requested that a preamble be added onto the AOI, uh, stipulating the company's duty to comply with all laws and regulations governing safety, management, and construction. Second, they sought the right for shareholders to make advisory proposals and recommendations regarding ESG. Third, they sought the establishment of the Health and Safety Committee within the BOD. And fourth, they sought the introduction of mandated sustainability disclosures. So the HDC BOD actually 
accepted the first, third, and fourth uh, resolution items, and uh, they were accepted uh, as agenda items for their AGM. However, they refused to accept the second proposal regarding shareholder proposals regarding ESG. And so at the actual shareholders meeting, um, the APG sought uh, or uh, filed this proposal as a shareholder proposal, but it was ultimately voted down and not adopted. So as you know, there are limitations to the Commercial Act in Korea and only matters that are subject to deliberation and determination by the general shareholders meeting uh, may qualify for a shareholder proposal. And so there are now uh, discussions on remedying uh, the system. Now, at the time, HDC and related parties held a combined 41.48% stake in the company's equity interest. And so with a controlling shareholder against the item, it was difficult to get a special resolution seeking an amendment to the AOI, which required two thirds of the votes of shareholders present to be approved. So although it was ultimately not adopted, um, the proposal, the shareholders' rights to make ESG proposals, um, still gained quite significant traction in Korea. Um, and Global Proxy Advisor ISS and Sustinvest, which is a local proxy advisor, recommended shareholders to vote for. And also a member of the expert fiduciary duty panel from the NPS also reportedly voted for the resolution. So again, ultimately rejected. It did help spread greater awareness on the need to introduce non-binding advisory shareholder proposals on ESG matters within Korea. And then this year, um, we also saw an ESG-related shareholder proposal raised again by Solidarity for Economic Reform, representing APG, to submit a shareholder proposal to KT on February 16th, 2023, seeking an amendment to its AOI. So what happened was that um, in November of 2020, KT filed a disclosure on its 300 billion treasury share buyback for the purpose of enhancing shareholder value. But according to findings by the Solidarity for Economic Reform, uh, it found that 80% of the treasury shares were in fact not used to boost shareholder returns, but used to acquire uh, favorable friendly stakes through treasury uh, share swaps. So um, Solidarity for Economic Reform requested an amendment to the AOI to require the company to report, to provide a report on the use of treasury shareholdings every year, and also to make acquisition of these types of mutual shares through treasury share swaps subject to approval by the general meeting of shareholders, and third, to adopt advisory shareholder proposals on ESG topics. So they requested that article um, what is it, 22-3 on advisory shareholder resolutions be newly added on to the AOI to allow shareholders holding a stake of 0.5% or more for more than six months to submit uh, shareholder proposals with advisory effect with these proposals to be resolved as ordinary resolution items. Upon approval, however, a report should be provided at the next annual shareholders meeting on whether or not the item was implemented the subject matter of implementation, and if not implemented, uh, what the underlying grounds for non-implementation were. So in other words, although a shareholder proposal upon approval is not legally binding, the company must report at the next shareholders meeting reasons for non-implementation. So we'll be watching with keen interest how uh, this item goes at the AGM, at KT's AGM this March. And um, actually, a bill was submitted to the National Assembly in January 2022 to adopt a new uh, uh, provision within the Commercial Act uh, to adopt advisory shareholder proposals. So these would be limited to non-binding advisory effect only, but then the criteria for shareholder resolutions would be eased um, beyond the current scope of the authority of the general shareholders meeting. And if um, there is non-implementation, uh, there must be notice provided to the shareholders within two weeks of that decision not to implement. So we will have to w wait and see what happens with this uh, 
uh, bill. And we'll have the um, you know shareholder meeting season start in March, so it will be interesting to see uh, what kind of proposals are filed at the shareholders meeting going forward. And we will watch with keen interest whether the bill that I uh, explained is also ultimately approved or not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. And so now we'll move on directly to session two. For the second session, we'll focus on shareholder climate change engagement and corporate communication. We're going to be inviting key stakeholders, uh, such as investors and CEOs, for companies. At the second session, uh, we'll be uh, moderated by managing partner, Yim Song Tech at Chipyong LLC for the discussion session. Hello. So continuing on, uh, we're going to begin our general discussion. We're joined by diverse um, experts, and industry practitioners from various fields. Uh, they've taken the time out of their schedule schedules to join us for the meeting. So let me now take a moment to just introduce our panelists. We'll give them uh, the chance to speak. First of all, um, uh, the Netherlands. EPG at Management, at, at Global Responsible Investment and in Governance, Asia Pacific Team. We have Yu Gyeong Park. And we have Valerie Kwan, who is the Director for um, Asia Investor Group on Climate Change. And also, Attorney uh, Yun Se Jung from Plant 1.5 is here as well. And we have um, offline participants here, Mr. Kim Hun Tae, a Vice President of Francosco Holdings, and Team Manager Im Jae Moon from LG Display, and Mr. Yi Jae Won, Project Leader from FK Bioscience. Bio -science. But first, Ha Gyu Kyung, Head of um, APG Asset Management Asia, will take the floor. So, as I, I said before, I am Ha Gyu Kyung. I'm the Head of a Responsible Investing at APG Asset Management Asia. Uh, Turning uh, Min, I gave such an insightful presentation, so I don't know if there's a lot more that I can add following his presentation. So let me now first explain to you why APG is doing what we do, uh, which is the stakeholder resolution, uh, which is really much, uh, very much based on legal grounds might be wondering why we're involved in this in the first place. We have an investment team, and we also have a responsible investing team separately. Each team is mandated with uh, shareholding resolutions. And uh, from the investment side, we have an initiative called Carbon Budget. From a first point of view, this actually becomes a self-constraint on what we do as an investor. So we first set aside a budget. Let's say that for 2020, for all of the companies they're uh, investing in, then we will calculate all, all of the carbon footprint from the companies that we invest in and that will give us a total carbon footprint for us. At the end of 2020, there, let's say there's 20 million tons of CO2 emissions. Based on that, that becomes a baseline for 2025-2030 uh, carbon budget. So we have to continue to reduce our carbon um, footprint, and we have to achieve uh, net zero by 2050. And we make our commitment to continue to net zero by 2015. So that means we're an investor. We have to work to reduce CO2 emissions for we have to actually divest um, our share from companies that are in carbon intensive um, industries. So well, that actually becomes a constraint to us, but we have to do it in a very strategic manner and we have to take a very aggressive approach in what we do. And the second team for responsible investment, they um, mobilize all of their for example, uh, rights as a proxy vote at AGM for conduct a shareholder engagement or to make a proposal for shareholder resolution. Of course, we don't want to go into the route, but we may have to file a lawsuit which comes to shove. There's an escalation of efforts to a responsible investment. One of the recent activities that we're 
often was focused in initiatives, of course, we're part of 100 plus as well. And we actively engage uh, with companies for our shareholder resolution, but there are also other companies that are not shared by C100 plus. Although they're still uh, generating a lot of CO commissions. So we, for example, select 10 companies from each country. We have 10 companies in Korea and 10 other companies in Japan. We monitor these focus companies and we're trying to roll it out to India or China. And also, we're going to have a cross-sector uh, Focus 10 initiative. So about 50 focus companies in the Asia-Pacific region will be identified uh, with much carbon-intensive industry uh, structure. And we will work around those focus companies. So we to track progress because a company has to reduce its carbon footprint and we have to uh, make equally uh, significant level of efforts. It's very important that we track what we do. So lessons learned for key takeaways. First of all, when we do engagement as a, as a shareholder, we have to do escalation. So we have to escalate, escalate our actions so that the companies themselves know that we're very serious about what we do. We're here to say that they're put under pressure to continue to show their performance. We have to do it together. So a spirit of collaboration is critical. And we have to take a practical approach. Let's be based on common sense. For example, what are some of the short-term actionable items that the company can work on and by giving such advice to the company, uh, they can uh, really draw themselves to promoting their performance or generating a better performance. For example, in terms of investment or financing, if the company really doesn't have a lot of understanding or it's very important that we have a holistic understanding, starting with the history, assets of the company, financing, uh, financials, so it's very important to have a clear understanding about the company. For example, we have people coming from the U.S. Bill, so next is divestment. That's uh, exiting your investment from a company. But it really doesn't work as it used to anymore. Especially I want to speak to NGOs who are here today. But please do not tell us to make a divestment decision. We're very serious about that because the engagement carries some weight, not divestment. It has no power. Even the companies themselves, let's say that we have to divest our shares uh, from a company, then it actually is delivered as good news uh, to the company. So we try to escalate our engagement rather than um, go towards the route of divestment. So please do not pressure us to divest our investment. Next, going forward, the direction for engagement. Of course, uh, we may have a meeting with the, as the shareholders. It's not about just having one-off meetings, but we need to focus on uh, impact-driven engagement. For example, if you push a company to do certain things, maybe there's an economic motivation or competitive uh, landscape to consider so it's difficult to bring changes. But we have to actually create an environment that forces the company to change. For example, uh, the company's client or a consumer, they're meeting their consumers. And we want to ensure that they receive a direct impact from their customers or client. Uh, we try not to be engaged in increasing uh, disclosure because we're actually past that point. We should focus more on progress. So by reducing carbon footprint, what are the effects from such efforts? What's the progress to uh, report on? That's where our engagement will focus on. Uh, and this 
his uh, HTC, which was already staying by the previous year. Uh, we had a snowboard proposal last year for HTC. We went back to the company. Now, once we make that resolution, just because there was a, a one resolution, it doesn't really lead to significant changes. It makes a lot of difference. So, if the so it's only a beginning of what we should do, not the end in our journey. It has to be continuous, sustainable, so that we can really drive the results. And as for Katie case, people really are as follows. We do shareholder engagement in ESG. I think the critical point is governance. If you don't have good governance, but if a company is quite proactive in terms of implementing policy for the environment or for the society, uh, it's really impossible to be good in E and S and not good in G. So once we, the prerequisite uh, for engagement will be governance, that actually lays a, a foundation or basis for improving ENS. So thank you, and that concludes my presentation. Uh, she talked about new trends, methodologies, experiences in terms of a shareholder engagement. Uh, here from a Korean presenter in the meanwhile. So we're going to have to mix up the schedule a little bit. We'll ask Mr. Sejong Ryun, lawyer at Plan 1.5, to go first. Uh, yes, this is uh, Sejong Yoon from law firm Plan 1.5. First of all, I'm very thankful. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. So why do we need shareholder engagement, especially um, for climate change related matters? Why is this important for the corporates and for civil society? Uh, what is the current status? What are the or institutional constraints holding things back? And these are some of the topics that I would like to talk about. The biggest challenge is that many companies actually recognize and appreciate the fact that some kind of climate change response is required and they have defined certain targets, but then um, actually they are late in terms of implementation. You have heard the word NIMBY, so for eyesores or polluting facilities, people don't want it in my neighborhood. They know that it's necessary, but then it may be seen, uh, seen as being too early on. And then if they can defer and put it off as long as they could, then they think that the total cost will go down. Uh, so there's a tendency to put things off. This is called the NIMGI phenomena which means not in my, or not during my term, please. So it's a, a slight play on words in Korean. So as a result, reduction is um, slowing down, or as emissions are on the rise. Actually, it's best to actually um, reduce emissions early on, so front load the emission reduction efforts and then focus on the more challenging reductions later on. That kind of front loaded curve is often advised, but then in actuality, we're seeing the opposite happen. And so we have to find some kind of a, a way, incentive to accelerate the corporate effort so that they do not uh, put this off. This is definitely not an issue of morality or the individual accountability of directors or management. It's just the underlying structure of our corporate system that places great priority on short-term gains. And there's limited incentive placed on mitigation of longer-term risks that are further out. So shareholders, especially the universal owners, these are the pension funds and the other institutional funds. I think, um, of course, most of them hold their... Uh, shareholdings for a long time. They are not frequent turnover traders. So they have the incentive uh, to promote and ask for long-term improvement. And I think it's the universal owners that should be more vocal so that there can be more balance introduced to the corporate decision-making process. I think that is very important. And the, the role uh, of shareholder engagement is that much more important. 
Um, so there are many constraints in terms of the scope of matters that can be subject to shareholder resolutions. And also there's a very a high threshold in terms of how many votes must be received to pass. And so even in comparison to Japan, the thresholds are too tight. So in Japan, although there are still some you know, limiting criteria, nonetheless, uh, the companies are being confronted by strong pressure and messages from uh, the shareholders through the shareholder resolution system. So we have to have that kind of improvement in Korea as well. So first, um, given the limited scope of matters that can be subject to uh, shareholder resolutions, we may think of the advisory shareholder resolution as an alternative. It would be more fundamental uh, and best to adopt legislation as a more fundamental uh, solution, but in the interim, um, I think we should consider advisory shareholding, shareholder proposals uh, because they can uh, help align nurses more and promote more uh, quick action on the part of the corporates. There's a, an organization called Big Wave. It's a youth-led NGO. It's preparing to file a shareholder resolution against POSCO. And so for these types of trends to gain more momentum, I think there should be more you know, ownership and support by the universal owners that I've talked about before, uh, so that if they lend them uh, these types of efforts more support, I think we can look forward to a greater drive or an increase in momentum. The role of institutions uh, like NPS is immense uh, given their presence within the capital markets as massive investors, and they also play a public role. And so they're held to the stewardship code and uh, ESG practices. So I think they should also play a bigger role to really um, amplify the voices from the, the ground up. And uh, we heard about shareholder engagement, uh, attorney Lim said that the whole point was about engaging in more relationships. And I think that was a very good point. These um, should not be seen as short-lived campaigns, but shareholder engagement helps um, and advisory shareholder resolutions actually can be very impactful and meaningful as well in uh, enhancing innovation and the capacity of the corporates to respond more effectively to climate change. Yes, thank you very much. We heard from the NGO's perspective um, about you know the trends of shareholder resolutions in Korea, legal constraints and limitations, and also some recommendations for improvement. Thank you very much. And I think we're uh, we have Valerie Kwan on the line again, so we'll try. Please go ahead, um, Valerie from AI GCC, if you could start up again. So, sorry about that. This is working all right now. Oh, the Zoom show. It's seems like uh, I'm not getting any feedback. But uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today. I think I'll just go directly into the first slide uh, here with the content in the interest of time. But I wanted to uh, start off by saying that uh, AIGCC is one of the five founding investor networks for Climate Action 100 Plus. Um, and within this current governance structure, it means that we have network CEOs and regional investor representatives sitting in the steering committee. So uh, uh, the logic behind uh, how Climate Action 100 Plus came about was that we selected focused companies that are key global industrial greenhouse gas emitters and really wanted to focus on leveraging the power of financial markets in order to drive change. So you might be aware that uh, the initiative has grown over time, and now we are uh, at over 700 investors with over 68 trillions of US dollars um, in total. And so AIGCC's role as the investor network, also as the secretariat, uh, which is also like all other regional networks, is to ensure that we're able to mobilize investors um, who, who have signed on to this initiative and to uh, enable them to drive change by working in partnership in others. So what that means in Asia in particular is that uh, we focus in particular in the recruitment of uh, investors with existing engagement uh, experiences in the region. I think that's key 
And we also want to support investors' dialogue with the companies about changing strategies and also preparing for transition because of climate change. And so we have developed some overarching guiding objectives. There are uh, tools that we have developed to support investors, one that I will go into a bit more detail shortly in the next slide. But just thinking longer term, uh, what we're very focused on at the moment is to encourage that over time, we also look into the demand side action to alleviate the sector specific ecosystems barriers that we, we do anticipate we'll, we'll encounter as we step into phase two uh, of the initiative next year. So as promised, um, I've mentioned here, uh, that uh, I'll, I'll put on the uh, the Climate Action 100 Plus Net Zero Company benchmark. Uh, that's one of the underpinning tools that we use uh, to support our investors in their engagements. Now, this benchmark, it has 10 components. Uh, that said, uh, we, we expect that to continue to gradually evolve over time because we want to continually push for best practices to come through in company disclosure and uh, to continuously uh, evolve the benchmark based on the best available science. So uh, the 10 components on the disclosure aspect looks at a wide range of indicators. We have indicators looking at company progress in target setting um, and all the way to, to, for example, capital alignment where invest, sorry, where companies are putting their money in terms of investments and whether that capital is aligned to the 1.5 degree net, uh, pathway. So these are important um, aspects that we need to track in order to understand what's really happening in the transition to net zero. Uh, because these form as the basis for us in terms of monitoring where company progress is at. Now, the benchmark, as I did mention, it will continue to evolve. Uh, the, the significance of launching this tool, um, amongst other ones, is that it makes it easier for investors to act on their fiduciary duty because they can then use the benchmark as a tool and to engage directly with company management and ultimately to hold board members accountable. Now, companies will need to demonstrate their intent to transition. So typically in most of the company engagement meetings, the uh, company's transition plans and the ability of the companies to showcase clear milestones and to demonstrate progress that typically would form the basis of, of the discussions in the meetings. But we do acknowledge that there is no one size fits all um, scenario with, uh, in terms of the benchmark, uh, but these 10 sort of uh, fundamental uh, disclosure components is one way that we use to monitor progress. And gradually we do aim to build in more spe sector specificities into the benchmark as well. Currently we do see some, for example, in the alignment assessments, you'll see some references to utilities, oil and gas and autos, but it's not comprehensive across uh, all the indicators. Uh, but that certainly is, is sort of uh, the way forward that we're looking at as well. Now, um, on the next slide, it's really a, a placeholder slide. Um, I, I thought there are some additional thoughts which might be relevant uh, given given sort of um, the structure of, of this current uh, uh, panel discussion that we've, we've set for. Now, uh, investors, uh, when, when we talk about uh, filing or supporting shareholder resolution, which is the topic for today, uh, we, we understand this opportunity as an opportunity to uh, for, for investors to hold board uh, level accountable for the commitment that they make. And also, uh, investors are able to use their votes as one of the mechanisms to hold uh, board members accountable. So if we, if we look into sort of the detail of the benchmark, some of the indicators that I can refer to would be, for example, board compensation. Are they in line with uh, with with um, the the objectives or the commitments that they've made uh, on in terms of climate? And we understand that engagements around these issues don't happen overnight. And the element of direct discussions and uh, and discussions with uh, the the company is critically important. So it's important that we use multiple tools 
throughout the process of engaging with companies, including dialogue, including voting, and including shareholder resolutions. So when, we, when it comes to contemplating a, a shareholder resolution, I think it really is an art backed by science. What I mean by that is um, there is a, a very, uh, uh, there is a due process that needs to happen uh, for, for the shareholder resolution to be filed. But at the same time, before that happens, there is certainly uh, discussions that need to happen in terms of understanding the challenges uh, in, 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 in companies' transparencies and, and disclosure of their transition plans. So the outcomes are very often contingent on the company's ability to share in as much detail as possible, the roadmap for the transition, for example, um, what their capex allocations are, what emerging technologies are involved, and to what extent they are the enablers or, or, or um, the the uh, the role uh, uh, that that is being taken in achieving the greenhouse gas reduction targets. So understanding the role of the emerging technologies that's also critically important. And ultimately, if some companies require a bit of external support to crystallize that change, then um, that's an option for, for investors. So uh, against this, this backdrop, we also need to understand that investors also operate in an environment where there are specific expectations from civil society um, and, and uh, there are risks of greenwashing, for example. And all of these do come together and have a role to play in terms of shaping the overall narrative. And and I think that's also something to to keep in mind as well when when there are sort of the investor company dialogue that do happen. So I think I'll just wrap up here by uh, saying that uh, within Climate Action 100 Plus, we are uh, close at, close to the the final stages of Phase One and ready to step into Phase Two towards the end of this year. Uh, in the year ahead and, and in the phase ahead, rather, I should say, uh, we do expect that there will be much clearer milestones, more detail on um, uh, the expectations around what, what interim targets are required and, and the, the extent to which we can make them as qualitative as, as possible uh, and, and more transparency overall. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I'll stop there uh, and I'll expect some questions towards the end as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I think, uh, yes, we heard a uh, lot of, and I am very impressed by your take how shareholder engagement is actually science based art. I was very impressed. So we have uh, three panelists, offline participants, uh, who are involved in shareholder engagement activities representing companies here. Sure, you have a good share of difficulty. So we'll be hearing from representatives from three companies. From Coco Holdings, our Vice President um, at the ESG team, Mr. Kim Hun Tae, will uh, take the floor first. Yeah. Hello, I'm from Coco Holdings. I'm from ESG team. Kim Hun Tae, thank you very much. I think that you have a lot of expectations and a lot of um, aspirations for us, a lot of affection for us as well. So I feel this is a responsibility. So we're joined by APG and ABCC. I'm not sure whether YK knows uh, me well. I've seen me many times on different occasions. So I really listen attentively to the stories. And in terms of our policies and our uh, company directions, I'm going to make sure that your messages are delivered to them. I think we could have a Q&A uh, later on, whether I will be able to take some detailed questions. And for example, what was mentioned by YQ, we feel that there is some pressure on us. Of course, uh, we're not looking at just one-off meetings where shareholders and companies get together, have a meeting, and that's it. But we know that that's not the right way to go forward. We feel continued pressure on us. 
So I'll be talking about climate change and shareholder engagement, but before I go into that, I'm going to talk about what Pesco has been doing to respond to climate change over the past two years. Uh, on the 2nd March last year, we launched the POSCO Holdings Picture. So POSCO is just one of the subsidiaries of the POSCO Holdings, it's a big umbrella company. And as was mentioned by YK, we're a carbon intensive company. So POSCO Chemical, which is not included as part of C100+, I think they mentioned that as part of the presentation. So we're trying to respond to the needs Years. So in 2020, March, we declare our support for TPFP. And here, December, we became the first Asian steelmaker, um, other than the European steelmakers, to declare the goal of carbon neutrality. And also, in alignment with the TCFP criteria, we also published a climate action report for the first time. And this process, the shareholders as well as stakeholder communication has surely had a significant impact. And we were able to do exactly this because of a certain strength that we have. We may think that we'll put snow, as was mentioned by you, but we're going to go net zero by 2050. This is because of the new mindset that was introduced with the declaration of the corporate citizenship management philosophy. So corporates, as the citizens of the world, have to be involved actively in addressing social issues, and they're also reflected as part of our OI. So we're embracing stakeholder capitalism. We're seeking to communicate with uh, stakeholders, including customers, employees, and shareholders, and all of our um, stakeholders to share understanding. We're driving our team communication and driving changes in innovation. Now, back in 2015, the Paris Accord was reached to limit global warming to less than 2 degrees Celsius. And in 2018, the 48th General Assembly of the IPCC was held in Incheon, which held a special report on global warming 1.5 degrees Celsius. There was a consensus on uh, limiting the global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Standard. And climate related investors' engagement activities increased as a result. And in the case of Portugal, of course, we had the largest emission of CO2 in Korea. And climate uh, change is a key agenda for engagement for shareholders. And also, AIGCC, which is the co host of this uh, event, is a member of a Hunger Plus initiative. And there are 66 companies that are carbon intensive. Uh, there's, a, for example, an instruction given to strengthen low carbon transition strategies. And transparent disclosure climate information is also important. POSCO so uh, Holdings, our IR team, Holdings that uh, we have ESG, IR team and ESG for. Uh, Pusco, so we're, we have different teams that are responsible for uh, different subsidiaries, and we have a conference call uh, once, you know, uh, once every now and then, and then we have internal communication about the expertise uh, from shareholders uh, because the steel industry, uh, it's a smokestack industry. It's quite difficult to drive changes overnight, and also in relative terms, in 2018, uh, we peaked our carbon emission in Europe. Uh, the peak came in the 1990s. So our country is in a different level of industrial development compared to other countries. And we are communicating to our investors about this. But Kohang still, uh, Kwangyang, still uh, to shut them down and to just transition out of coal, uh, that would be an impossible decision for us to make uh, for economic reasons. I think it's really about the timing, uh, short term or long term. We cannot just start to incur uh, losses just for that transition. So when we have a C100 plus phone calls, conference calls, uh, the calls involve uh, seven to eight investment institutions, but also there are individual shareholders who want to have conference calls 
separately. For example, when the holding was launched last year in March, POSCO declared a carbon neutrality with the group, whether the group had the overall company strategy for carbon neutrality. That was a question that was posed to us. I think that was back in April. So with POSCO Chemical and POSCO Energy, uh, which is now merged into uh, POSCO International, so we decided to just publish our carbon neutrality um, strategy right away. So at the beginning of the climate change conversation, the focus was whether we had goals in line with the Paris Agreement, whether there were goals and strategies for carbon neutrality implementation. But before we, up until we declared carbon neutrality by, in December 2020, there was criticism that we didn't have any net zero goals. But we uh, began to work on our preparations starting from 2019, and we came up with a specific network transition strategy. Uh, we have an implementation strategy. Uh, after we establish the goal, details on how to implement the roadmap, specific short and midterm targets, and financial impact and carbon reduction are some of the areas investors are interested in finding out. So the topic of conversation with shareholders is, after all, closely related to climate disclosure. But what the IFRS you have been uh, recently preparing for disclosure criteria. POSCO, of course, is a, a more granular uh, carbon neutrality strategy. We cannot uh, share that for confidential purposes. So we internally share that information and also through sustainability reports, uh, business reports, uh, we're going to work to make sure that such a specific strategy is made public. And other than the disclosed information, and also, for example, confidential uh, discussions that take place within the company, but such information is not accepted by the investors because they're not publicly available information. And lastly, communication and engagement should be eventually accompanied by change. And from the investor's point of view, rather than divestment, as was mentioned by YK, making a decision to withdraw or exclude investment, they would also want to understand the company more accurately through engagement. And if the company shows more some meaningful changes, I'm sure the investors will want to continue by their investment. By doing so, we can drive our value. We can become a company that is sustainable and making contributions to society. Of course, I mean, that is aligned with company values. Uh, what's really important is for companies to clearly understand the needs of external stakeholders and incorporate their voice in the company strategy. So in the case of Costco, we have an internal momentum created by the corporate citizenship management philosophy. But through continuous communication with external stakeholders, we were also able to forge a very challenging goal of carbon neutrality. And I believe that they can be translated into reality. So please uh, keep your interest in our company. We may go slow, but be patient with us. We will get there as promised. Thank you. With that, I will close my, I will finish my call. Thank you very much. So one of the next results, I think POSCO is one of the companies that is leading the, leading the effort among the industries. And you need to us about your um, efforts and the type of engagement activities you've had with shoulders. So thank you very much for your time. Display, yeah? Oh, yes, next, sir. we will move on to Mr. Uh, Jaemun Lim, team manager of ESG strategy at LG Display. Uh, yes, very nice to meet you. I'm from um, LG Display's ESG strategy team, um, team manager Jaemun Lim. Um, I would like to thank managing director Song Tae Lim from Chikyong, also everybody at AI GCC, uh, and um, uh, Head of uh, APG Asset Management Asia, Ms. Yu Kyung Park, as well. Um, I think this actually lets us appreciate the urgency of this matter even more. At LG Display, um, I've prepared uh, some presentation materials um, and when I was asked to talk about the latest shareholder engagement trends and effective communication strategies, I was thinking 
um, you know, what the different stakeholders would be most interested in, the, the NGOs, corporate side, or the investors. So uh, what kind of issues when raised to the companies? How, you know, what is the mechanism within the companies to deal with those issues? So if I were somebody looking in to our company, I think that would be something I would be curious to know. So I would like to talk about um, those or that perspective. So under the BOD, an ESG committee was installed uh, to put in place a framework for our directors. And um, we wanted to make sure that it was complete first, both vertically and horizontally. So what kind of communication framework we would put in place was very key. The first thing that we looked at was um, first from the business point of view. How can we categorize the different aspects of ESG to articulate further? We actually identified nine key tasks. So uh, climate change response, uh, recycling or circular resources, management of hazardous materials and product liability. And then we also wanted to uh, reflect an operational point of view uh, with people-oriented values at the center, which is aligned to our overall company values. And so workplace safety, management of uh, business partners, human rights, center business and human capital, those were the key tasks that were under uh, identified under that point of view. So we wanted to put together this overall governance uh, framework. And um, so a system was in place for ESG due diligence and also for communicating with our investors, shareholders. So, um, you can see the structure on the right hand side. Um, the ESG committee actually sits above the CEO and uh, underneath the CEO, there are subcommittees. And so um, governance structure and then the different subtasks by category. We have different C-level champions that are assigned by individual tasks. Um, that's under the subcommittee. So we are working on uh, dozens of tasks at the same time. So at the very bottom of this you know, chart on the right-hand side is the, the execution team at the very bottom. And then I think um, the organizers wanted me to talk about actual case studies. So over the past one year, how many inquiries did we get from our investors? And what we did, what we did, we get in terms of shareholder engagement. Overall, there were about 20 cases last year, and of the 20, um, in, well, every year in July we actually publish an ESG report, and so um, we took out engagement that is included in the uh, report. So conference call inquiry, CO letters. Um, those types of items were actually about six to seven out of that total of 20. And then there were times where we sent out a notice after one or two conference calls. So overall, for company A, they asked about our governance structure. For company or investor B, they asked about our strategy and response toward climate change. Investor C asked us about our ESG rating asking why, uh, what was the rationale behind what they seemed to believe was a very high ESG rating. A consulting company called D actually asked us about our emission reduction strategy. Investor E inquired about the safety accident we experienced at the Paju workplace, and they wanted us to just follow up and update uh, them on what happened afterwards. And then Investor G asked us about the current status of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions and how you know we're managing the emission what kind of green uh, projects we had underway so under investor b so we responded that we have reduced our emissions um by about 60 percent relative to our emissions in 2014 so that was included in our response to investor b and uh, regarding esg due diligence and ratings I think it was uh, 2020 or 
I think 2019 and 2020 actually, but there were um, some issues regarding the Uyghur ethnic group in China. We do have six uh, production sites in China, so there was an issue surrounding that minor ethnic minority group. And um, we had our existing ESG due diligence system already in place. Before it was a sample base, but starting last year, it's uh, all inclusive for all 500 business partners that we work with. So they are included in the full scope of due diligence, every uh, one of the business uh, partners. So we're accumulating that kind of evidence and that database. We do self-assessment questionnaires as well. Um, as part of the due diligence, again, for all of the vendors and business partners that we work with. Regarding GRC, um, you know, risk or issues regarding governance structure, we took upon a bottom-up approach and uh, people were you know, emphasizing the importance of escalation. So we were sorting items that had to be escalated versus what we could take care of on our own. And uh, we will use this kind of framework in the future to engage more proactively with our investors and shareholders. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Lim from LG Display. So regarding shareholder engagement, um, what kind of internal governance structure they have now in place to respond to engagements, um, what kind of engagement inquiries they had last year, and then looking forward, uh, their structure for due diligence. Well, thank you for that very detailed explanation. I think it was very helpful in understanding the current status. The last panelist is from SK Group, SK Bioscience. We have IEJ1, project leader of Value Innovation. Hello. I'm EJ1, project leader of Value Innovation Lab at SK Biotones. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, my partner Yin Song Tech, or Chi Chong, and AIDCC, and Yu Gyeong Park for giving me this opportunity. Because I'm out there in the field, I'm meeting with the shareholders, I can even feel the significant changes that have been brought about by shareholder engagement. Like in 2017, when I worked in IR, uh, YK asked about corporate governance in an IR. And a company uh, worked with the, um, proactively to build governance structure. And Korea introduced a uh, stewardship code back then. And non financial reporting requirement became a hot thing for companies. We came up with that as well. So corporate governance disclosure was introduced. And especially, we get a lot of questions regarding the environment. The fact that we're having this webinar as well today, I believe that there will be a lot of changes in the legislative environment in Korea. SK Bioscience, uh, for the first time in biopharmaceutical industry, first uh, published TCFT, uh, that contains our environment non financial values. And we also uh, set up uh, RE100 for 2024 and Net Zero for 2031. We published CCFT for the first time. And healthcare industry accounts for about 44% of the situations around the world. And our industry can also provide treatment and care for patients. And also, we're involved in pre-vaccine vaccine development uh, with our shareholders, uh, stakeholders, and we also contribute to development of the healthcare industry and the direction that we want to move ahead, I believe, is going to help us uh, become a leader in climate change response. And from an IR point of view, uh, we work with a lot of global institutional investors, together with the ESG team, to update them on our ongoing efforts and to understand the expectations uh, from the market. And we try to convey that message to the board as well as management. So sustainable engagement or sustainability and also attracting long-term investment. And I think the, these three goals are aligned with one another. 
but most in terms of ESG related uh, shareholder engagement, we will continue to align uh, their needs uh, to our strategy and we will do the best we can. Thank you very much. So, thank you. From the pharmaceutical bio industry, uh, the company shared information on uh, shareholder engagement. And so we just heard from six panelists. So shareholder engagement on climate change, we heard about the methodologies and approaches and how it is actually being done on the field and how companies are trying to incorporate uh, these ideas into their processes and healthcare. So we're dealing with a the common theme over here for a panel discussion, but we don't have a lot of time. So we have received some questions prior to the start of the meeting. So we are, we're going to be going over the list of the questions to uh, post some questions to the panelists over here, and we will try to open up the floor if we have any time left. Director uh, Nim. Uh, 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 or Director uh, Valerie Kwan. Um, so, if the connection is clear at your end, we have two questions for you written in. So, regarding shareholder engagement, there are many different methods that could be used. And of course, um, it may have the effect of uh, enhancing accountability of the directors. But of the various options, available for shareholder engagement. Is there any particular method that is more prevalent nowadays or anyone that appears to be more favored over the others? And then this, I didn't uh, consult with you previously, but in the Asian context, there are many different countries, obviously, but in terms of the climate change response or shareholder engagement or communications of the Korean corporates in particular, how would you rate the current status in your experience? So would you feel comfortable answering right away? Yes, certainly. So thank you for the question. Um, I'll start off with the initial question around what, kind, what kinds of uh, engagement tools are often sort of used and and i think the specific uh question that you had was if there's any preference of one over the other in short i think there isn't mainly because uh it really is i, I did sort of uh, talk about art and science just now um it wasn't uh aimed to be sort of a gimmicky kind of a reference it what i really mean by that is at different times, different tools needs to be considered. And of course, uh, in the Asian context in particular, we do truly value the process of direct dialogue with the companies. And I think that part is uh, critically important, especially in terms of establishing the cornerstone of understanding where different investors stand and understanding sort of the, the existing communication that happens between companies and investors. That said, um, I think a lot uh, of people on the panel have uh, established and also acknowledged the uh, urgency of the issues around climate change. What that means is that um, we are sort of in between a, a, a common saying that we would say is sort of between a hard place and a rock, which means that we have to act really fast, but at the same time, we are uh, cognizant of the challenges that companies in Asia are facing. What that means is that in certain elements, we certainly utilize the private dialogues that are critically important in terms of understanding where sort of where where the progress really is at. But at the same time, sometimes it genuinely helps companies crystallize uh, and and sort of make public their commitments through uh, the the aid of other parties through investors and, and through shareholder resolutions, for example, and also other tools that we've mentioned uh, through votes uh, and demonstrating what investors think uh, through, through their voting rationale. So all of these tools have its own role to play in the overall process. I wouldn't say there's preference for one over the other because they all function, um, they, they ha all have their own function in, in um, to some extent. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Uh, with regards to where Korean companies stand, I usually try to avoid that in particular, mainly because it would be a general statement overall if I were to say they, they rank sort of 
midway or, or, or anything outside of, of that ranking system. And for that very reason as well, it, within the benchmark uh, tool that I've uh, uh, shared with the group uh, earlier just now, we, we don't have ranking um, uh, in, in the mechanism if, if you sort of look at that a bit more closely. And, and the very reason for that is because, um, yes, whilst it's somewhat helpful to understand where people rank as, as, as sort of if, if we think about the days when we, we were in school, probably, you know, there, there would be ranking among students. Um, but then it's really important that we understand what the challenges are for different sectors. And of course, I did acknowledge upfront just now, some of the limitations with the benchmark is that it doesn't um, go into the specifics of, of each of the sectors. And that's something that we're working on. And we have uh, other enablers such as uh, sector strategies. It outlines sort of ex expected or recommended actions by companies and by, uh, by investors. So that's sort of the complementary element that comes in. But with regards to where Korea stand, I think it has a lot to do with where the country positions itself in Asia, and also your sort of, um, if we look at the broader uh, remit in terms of where the opportunities of trade are and what the country's role is in the in in the um, in, in the pathway to decarbonization, I think these are important questions to ask um, before uh, understanding where where the company should sort of how the company should position themselves uh, in in the overall course of decarbonization. Uh, but it's not perhaps the rating answer that you, you perhaps were hoping to get, but then uh, that, that would be my response. Uh, yes, thank you. So rather than the ranking per se, I wanted to um, just, you know, hear about your view about you know the response what kind of response uh you have seen generally from korean companies maybe through the, the translator used the word ranking i don't think so but maybe the uh, there was miscommunication now we'll move on to Ms. park so perhaps other panelists could uh share in as well we talked about goals and the methodologies for shareholder resolution we talked about divestment, which is a last resort and which really proves not to be so effective. But it's important to engage with the company to actually drive performance without them really fully share the thought with you. For the PRI, the responsible investment, we talk about the negative as well as positive screening. I think it's along the same line that global investors or pension funds are not just stopping at negative screening, but they're moving beyond for positive screening to understand uh, where they are in terms of positive screening and how that is serving as an incentive for climate change response. So in terms of responsible investing, the trend and any case examples, uh, can you share that with us? Okay. So, yes, you're right on the point. So, we do negative screening. Actually, both sides of the coin. And we compare because the results of the negative screening actually become positive screening. That actually leads to a scaling up of investment. Let's say that you're starting with 100 trillion won and you're investing in 10 different companies. And maybe 10% of the companies gone are from negative screening. What about 90%? You have to put your money somewhere. So there are positively screened companies that are still left in the universe, and more money will go into those companies. If we stay negative screening, but the result is actually on the upside, on the positive screening. Especially the strong, robust companies will be able to benefit. We stay at uh, ESG premium these days. Companies that have a strong governance, with very transparent BOD management, are communicating effectively with shareholders and the reflective back uh, into the company management that leads to creation of a premium. So, if there's, for example, a, we don't really have any sell down issues. 
goes with the premium. So he's considered as the size of the coin, especially impact investment or impact investing. Is emerging as a very hot topic these days. From the point of view, you can see how, where the fund is flowing into, where that is flowing into. One of my concerns is that we do negative screening of companies, but sometimes we have very regrettable cases where a company is committed to making changes, but it is not translated into the progress. So the company, uh, regardless of these situation, uh, has been negatively screened. And from an institutional investor's point of view, we have to actually do the hand-holding. We want to do the hand-holding with the company in that process of uh, transition, but we're always running out of time. So NGO or NPOs, they don't, as, a, as our stakeholders, they don't wait for us. So we would have to move very fast. And as for the shareholder resolution, which is the main topic of the webinar today, I just want to reiterate my point again. We have shareholders, long-term shareholders, and companies DOD. It is about having the conversation and communication between the two sides. Because it's Literally, a shareholder making a proposal, a resolution, but it is interpreted as a very aggressive move within the boundaries of law that you're attacking a company aggressively. But please don't take it that way. So we have attorneys from uh, Ji Pyeong, but shareholder resolutions proposals literally means a proposal. So let's try to create the culture that accepts that understands it. So, thank you. Uh, so well said, OIK. I agree with you on your last point. When we first began this discussion, I said uh, engagement is about building relations because engage uh, means building a relationship. Relations or engagement, but it's really for engagement may be uh, constrained as a negative um, engagement. For example, a small shareholder that really don't have any strong rights, but they're trying to intervene in the company management. It shouldn't, should not be construed in a negative light. But it is actually about building relations between uh, the company and shareholders. And shareholder engagement uh, should be interpreted in the same way. Same way and we need to raise awareness in that regards. And I'm going to ask you, Sejong. So, uh, regarding shareholder engagement, Mr. Yoon, you emphasize the importance of the role of the universal owners, the investors. So, I have two questions for you, Mr. Yoon. For local investors, they tend to be more passive towards shareholder engagement. So, why do you think that is? In order to change this, what should the NGOs do or what kind of initiative could help? Regarding stakeholder engagement also, the NGOs are of course involved as well as one of the stakeholders. So based on your experience, engagement by NGOs, uh, what is the status there and what kind of challenges uh, have you observed? Um, yes, so thank you. Uh, first, in Korea, regarding investors, you know, shareholder engagement, uh, regarding climate change, I think uh, if this was a lesser priority for local investors, that is clear. And NPS, which is a public pension fund, it has such a big presence. So before it defines its stance, you know, the other investors don't really act proactively. And then on the other end, the NPS, because it is so big, once it establishes a certain stance, it's sort of careful because it will have too big of an impact on the market. So it's uh, reluctant there. So that's why all the parties actually did not take up much initiative. So right now, I think it's up to the NPS and also other institutional investors like the insurance companies, the pensions, that should also step up concurrently to play a bigger role. But actually, there has been meaningful 
uh, achievements. Um, we've seen divestments across the board in coal-related uh, investments. And so the NPS, they are actually in discussions regarding that kind of divestment, but they have not actually reached a conclusion yet. So I think at the very least, they should move together. Rather than waiting for somebody to move first, I think everybody should be aligned and move together. In terms of challenges faced by the NGOs, up to now, it's the corporates and the NGOs were really sort of guarded against each other, holding uh, each other in check. So it's about you know healthy tension. But under the ESG theme, um, the, those who actually were the most critical of the companies are best informed to tell the investors what they know and what the potential sources of risk can be. So now engagement pathways, well, I think it should be broadened so that it's more cooperative. Uh, rather than just legalistic. So once these types of channels become more broader, there will be more of a you know collaborative relationship rather than one of conflict between the corporates, uh, the investors, and the NGOs as well. So the, regarding the shareholder engagement, the advisory engagement, I hope that the, the companies are more open to that initiative. And if the institution investors actually step up a little bit more, I think that they, that can really get things moving more. And then we'll ask the questions from the three corporate representatives that have joined us today. So you've been quite um, open-minded about uh, shareholder engagement. I know your companies are leaders in that, but there are many others that are not in the room, uh, people who are, or companies that are uh, that have new uh, shareholder engagement. So especially Joining us here as leaders in terms of corporate engagement, social engagement, or engagement with civil society and with investors, as was mentioned by uh, Hun Kim, do you have any suggestion or do you have any message that you want to deliver to civil society? Well, if not, we can skip that question. Uh, yes. So when we work on ESG issues, I become you, Mr. Lim, at a company. So we have our own roles to play. So we were in that standoff in a way. We're on either end of the spectrum, but I think the distance has to be uh, short, it has to be narrow, and we have to create a culture. Once we had that consensus, we seem to have a high acceptability for discussion. But for example, when you're back in school, when you really don't like that person, you don't really want to learn what the person has to say, even if good thing, or even if the person is talking about something that is beneficial for you. So now we're here in the process of creating this culture for engagement. And the country has gone through a rapid development uh, looking at the level of industrial uh, development and sophistication as well as uh, accumulation of capital compared to the United States and European countries. Of course, uh, there's good improvement for Korean companies, but there's really a lot to learn. So there are millions and billions of ways of resolving problems. So we don't really have to resolve problems as one specific method. We don't have to predefine the solution. We don't have to force people to just take that, whether it's civil society or investors. I think we have to keep uh, ourselves open minded and we have to engage in conversation. I think that's the best way. We think the same way. Osco has its own limitations. And although we're not making it uh, publicly available, the information, we have more initiatives coming along the way. Once we open that up, uh, we can really improve our relationship and we will have more to work with uh, each other. Given that. So, SPTI for a country uh, like Korea, is that the right path? We understand that we have to um, do hydrogen reduced uh, steel and iron. We know that there is a right, right way 
forward and be happy with investment. And also Gwangyang, um, Gwangyang Neo on the Costco is a very competitive facility. Now we're living in trying to go towards a zero. So tables are actually turning. So the competitiveness and net zero carbon neutrality, they have to be compatible goals. And we have to strike the right balance between the two ideas. If you have time, or if you have time, uh, you can call me time. And I will also involve uh, people from other departments in that discussion. Thank you. So, with our, um, well, this is a webinar co hosted with the AI GCC, and we have lots of uh, foreign audience members, about 100 or about 40 um, foreign participants joining us. Um, out of total of 140 uh, participants, I believe. So we have not been able to you know, open the discussions to the floor, but there is a question that was written in that is actually related to what Mr. Uh, Hunte Kim just mentioned. So given the reality of the steel making industry, of course there are going to be constraints. There are a lot of requirements on carbon neutrality, there are economic incentives issues. That's a breakthrough. Uh, and mandate a low carbon market. And what is your thought on this? For the low carbon steels and irons. Uh, for, we have a hydrogen reduced um, iron. So, in order to make the hydrogen process, we have just embarked on our investment in terms of strategy. So what are the strengths we have at post uh, It's a non-furnace. Well, when you're, when you make steel because the carbon is actually generated from the production of uh, steel, we had a process that did not generate uh, that emissions. And we have a, a steel making process called Hilex so we're embarking on investment in 2035. Uh, the process will be fully developed, and it is going to be good as a, a push towards uh, net zero. And some of them will be used for electricity and applications as well. So thank you. I actually have, yeah, I needed to ask a question because we had the question on the list. And then uh, for Mr. Lim and Mr. Lee, so um, yes, why don't we ask for some closing remarks and don't feel limited by the questions that I may have asked up to now, please. Um, for corporates, plan uh, 1.5 to limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, um, Given the current state of crisis, uh, we as a company understand the direction that we have to move toward and the demands upon us by the investors, the concerns of various stakeholders. We want to be very receptive and uh, through, we want to also not only reflect um, these, this kind of feedback, but also take initiative voluntarily as well. We are a display company and uh, we belong to a state-of-the-art industry, and we feel that we can find uh, very pioneering ways to lead that kind of change, and we will do that going forward. Uh, yes. Let me just make my comment very brief. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. I think it's better to meet with your investors as often as possible that the management understands where we should head and we really start to see these changes within our own structure. So I hope that we will have more communication. And SK Bioscience is a leading player in the pharmaceutical industry. We committed efforts to become a leader in a CO2 um, emission reduction to climate change. 
So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time for the Chikyong LLC AIG CC webinar. Thank you for your time again. Uh, we had some connection issues at the beginning of the uh, session, so we would like to apologize to you on behalf of the organizer. It was a very short webinar for two hours, yet we were able to understand the various trends related to the uh, shareholder engagement, investors' perspectives, as well as companies' view. It was a very useful uh, session to be learned from different stakeholders. The conclusion of the webinar, the bottom line is, do not feel so pressured or do not feel so burdened by the fact that we have to do engagement with the shareholder. That could, could actually be a good opportunity for us to uh, contribute yourselves to the development of society in terms of environment, governance, and that could serve as an opportunity to ensure a healthy growth, sound growth of the company. So using this as an opportunity, I hope that um, shareholder engagement discussion uh, will become more active and will produce tangible results with some great uh, best practices. So once again, we would like to thank our virtual participants, um, CC and also Client Earth. I, I really hope to meet you. But I'm a managing partner, partner at Chikyong Our clients are companies. I think there are about 200 lawyers are working at Client Earth. So they say client is Earth. So that's very symbolic. So again, thank you very much. And also our panelists, Yoon Se Jung uh, from Fund 1.5. And also like to thank the representatives from companies and industries. Thank you very much. And this concludes the webinar.